Hello and welcome to Better Under Pressure. I'm Sarah Milne Rowe, author of The Shed Method and founder of Coaching Impact. And in this podcast, I talk to leaders from all walks of life about being better under pressure and using pressure for better. I want to explore how we handle pressure in a world that is becoming more and more complex, the impact that that pressure has on our ability to perform at our best and what we do to be better under pressure. I was chosen to be a general to go and be a commander. That was my first general's appointment. So now I was thinking to myself, holy shit, uh, this is straight in the deep end. And then somebody said, you're going to Bowser. And people were patting me on the shoulder said, good luck, mate. You know, wouldn't, wouldn't want your job. You soon realize that actually it's up to you. You're the general. You can either make a difference or you, you can either fail. And then I said, well, I'm going to make a difference. You've got to realize if you're the general in charge of a campaign, how you are, whether you smile or not, the way you treat people sets the tone for everything. From the very, very moment that you pitch up, you have to work out how you're going to settle everybody down, reduce the pressure, get this sense of purpose and just collect everybody. We did that and it made a phenomenal difference. Today, I'm talking to Andy Salmon, CMG and CBE, who was a Royal Marine for 36 years. A former Commandant General Head of Service, his frontline action included the Falklands War, Sierra Leone, the Kurdish humanitarian crisis in Northern Iraq, the civil war in Angola, and lastly, as Commanding General Coalition Forces handing over Basra in 2009. Between 2011 and 13, He built the Crisis Management Center for NATO and was responsible for finding forces for their global operations, including Afghanistan. Since retiring, he's founded Journey Through Conflict, a multimedia theatre company that creates performances to help alleviate suffering in people from myriad conflicts. He also takes elements of the performance into businesses to coach them in co-creating journeys to success. In our conversation, Andy reveals why he used to carry around a crash helmet without having a motorbike, why he believes in enforced rest, and what memorable tactic he used to make sure his troop was awake before a big attack. Andy, so good to see you, and thank you so much for coming on the podcast to talk about pressure. Sarah, uh, thank you so much for inviting me. We've been talking about this off and on for years, but um, it's great to focus on it. Thank you very much. and I. I'm excited actually about this conversation because you're the first person to come on with a military background. Um, So, you know, we've been talking about pressure in various different situations, but I think you're the first person to just check this, but I think you're the first person I've spoken to where pressure comes, could potentially end in death. That's that's so the stakes true. are pretty high. The stakes are pretty high in your world or in your older world, not your in my old world, yeah. The, the stakes have been high, albeit actually I felt some pressure in certain circumstances, which has been you know sort of greater and worse in, in the business context. So Interesting. Um, I can I can understand that uh, in business the pressure is immense and people really suffer a lot if they don't know how to handle that. Absolutely. So let's start with you. And how would you describe your relationship with pressure? I think that I have come and learned to understand what pressure is in relation to the context that one finds oneself in or one finds your team or your organization in. And so I think it's important to understand you personally and how you handle pressure, knowing what you're up for and knowing what you're not. And that comes from a certain amount of experience, but also knowing yourself um, and, you know, getting rid of the ego to try and, make sure that you've got a measured appreciation based on good awareness of yourself. Because I think that's really important to understand the different types of pressures and how we can deal with them, how we can mitigate them and or how we can use them. Because the ideal is that we understand whatever pressure is around and we use it in a positive sense to make good decisions. Yeah. 
uh, for whoever whoever you're dealing with, whatever context you're in. In my military context, you know, some quite big scenarios. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, before we dig into those, can you remember, Andy, first ever, your first experience of pressure? Yeah, well, actually, because I had a good voice as a kid. My first ever experience of pressure was having to regularly stand up in front of the whole school and sing solos. Yeah, from about the age of four. But they yeah. didn't stop you so, singing, hey? It didn't stop you singing. It didn't stop me singing, but it used to get, you know, the you know, the, the, the more senior the school and the bigger the audience became, the more abuse I used to get. So <laughs> was that because you were singing rather than the way you were singing? I think you were singing and 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 uh I, I guess that you were sometimes shy of just being good at what you were doing and something that you loved doing. And so it was the, the pressure was sometimes about how other people felt about you. Yes. Uh, I think that was a, I think that's my first sort of awareness of pressure. Yeah. Oh, I love uh, that because that's so interesting, isn't it? Because you're talking about two types of pressure in there for me. The, the pressure of actually performing as a young age, singing, and the impact yeah. that pressure has on your voice at that point. But also you're talking about people's opinion of you. Yeah. That's exact that's exactly it. And the peer pressure and how you how you feel about what others think of you. And at, at, at a younger age, you're always uh, slightly uh, sensitive to that, aren't you? Yeah. Especially if you're different, especially if you're different and you I'm not saying that I've been particularly mega talented at, at, at things, but when you're using your gift. Yes. And uh, it's obvious that you have a gift. Lots of people respond in very different ways, especially if it's a young competitive environment at school or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can remember feeling that because I played the violin. I was one of four people in a very, very large comprehensive school that played the violin. You know, you just didn't do that if you were part of the core group. Um, and I used to come to school on my bike with my violin yeah. on the handlebars. Not yeah. just wasn't cool, wasn't ex wasn't accepted, got ridiculed. It's hard, that sort of stuff when you're young. I, I think I took the coolness to such ridiculous levels by pretending that I was a cool motorcyclist by having the most expensive bell helmet and getting lifts on other people's bikes and walking around Guildford holding this helmet looking cool. You know, how ridiculous is that? But anyway, we, we do those things to sort of fit in, don't we? And um, and have greater self-esteem amongst our peer peers. Yeah. And and when you, um, as you got older, did you know that you wanted to train to be a Marine? Well, I knew that I wanted adventure. I knew I wanted to do something different and actually had quite a passion for uh, military history and uh, quite spottery, but I used to war game as a child at school. Uh, so I was always, I had a sort of room, uh, well, my parents had pubs and restaurants and things. So I always had a massive room somewhere in the establishment where I could lay out the whole of my models and dioramas. And because I was reading around the subjects, like a battle of, you know, I was representing a battle and or we're war game in the battle of Waterloo, because I was reading around that, I suddenly started to get very interested in military history. Mm -hmm. And I think coupled with the adventure from reading too many Alistair McLean books instead of, you know, I used to have an Alistair McLean book in my Latin textbook at school. Mm -hmm. You know, teachers would be asking me questions. I wouldn't have a clue what, what they were asking. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was reading my Alistair McLean book because I just wanted some adventure and to get out and do different things. And so I think that's one of the reasons why I ended up joining the Royal Marines. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, I, as you know, I run Coaching Impact with a, an ex-Royal Marine and you've done a lot of work and a lot of the stuff that we do together is how do you take the lessons from that into a leadership in an organisation, for example. T talk about how you managed as a young man to build your capacity to deal with the pressure of A, the training and B, the situations that you found yourself in. Yeah, I think that for me personally, when I when I look back at whenever I was in performing at my best in whatever environment that actually happened to be, and still is the case now, I always used to want to be really fit. 
So I always found that if I was physically fit, I almost felt able to do absolutely anything. Hmm. Um, and I took that to a slight extreme, I suppose, going into the Royal Marines. And that definitely paid, paid off. And I had that attitude that nothing was going to finish me. Nothing was going to stop me. And I was a bit, I suppose it was a bit awkward, awkward as well and stubborn about some things. So I, I didn't really give up on things. You know, I was going to commit to something, I'm going to do it, and it doesn't matter how painful it's going to be. To such an extent that when we were in really painful episodes in training, in commando training, uh, there was an element of sardenfoid in looking at other people crack up first, knowing that, well, you know, if they're cracking up, that's great because I'm still going and I'm not going to crack up. And actually, you know, we've... I've gone over a threshold where I feel sort of I've, I've gone from the discomfort to the comfort threshold, even though we're out of our comfort zone. I know that sounds strange. So with commander training as well, you're just pushed into so many different things that you've never done before. And so you're often out of your comfort zone. And I mean, it's progressive, but you're still pushed the whole time. And if you just go with that and you just accept that that's what's going to happen, then there's not as much pressure on yourself. You're just going with the flow of whatever's going on. You put everything into it um, and enjoy it as much as you can, even ha however however painful it is. You know, sometimes you're just going to have a sense of humor about it. And so I always had that attitude, and that got me through training. I, mean, I didn't perform necessarily brilliant in training, but I never had a problem in training, and especially with all the physical things that a lot of people did have problems with. Because when they started to physically break down, that's when they mentally broke down. And so mm -hmm. I think the two go hand in hand. There was, a, there was an incident which, which is interesting, um, a very, very quick story. You know, we passed our commander course. We had our green berets on, and we are in our last phase of training. And uh, we were all supposed to do a speed march in you know, the morning after my birthday party. And the whole of my group, we'd sort of gone down to Exeter and got absolutely hammered. And I was sort of left up in a tree at 3.30 in the morning and somebody found me in Exeter and brought me back. At 7 o'clock, we had to get up and, you know, I was still so um, affected by the alcohol. <laughs> so they put me as the rear traffic marker for this speed march. And the whole of this group, this batch we were called, were in absolute tatters, so shambolic, that the guy in charge said, well, you're going to speed march until you know how to speed march. And we ended up going on a 17 three-quarter speed march, which lasted three hours. And at the end of that, there was only six of us left. And there was me and five other guys. Everybody else had collapsed, um, you know, dehydrated, um, you know, <laughs> horror stories. The green berries were taken off everybody who collapsed. Um, and the people who didn't make that speed march uh, had to go for five weeks of punishment duties oh. to get their green berry back. So they had to do lots of commando tests again over five weekends. Um, now, what was interesting about that moment for me, because uh, you kind of I rapidly sobered up as I everybody was collapsing. And so as they were put into the sort of wagon, uh, you know, to go back to sick bay, I would drink all their water. So I was just getting stronger and stronger as the as the as the march went on. But I was also determined that I was never going to give in to whatever was going to happen. And the other five people who um, passed that horrendous event uh, all had that sort of like-minded determination. And when I look at how people performed in the Falcons' War, because all of us went from training into our first commands, which happened to be in the Falcons' War, um, I looked at every person who passed that test and they all performed really well in the war. So there is an element of mindset, uh, never giving up, but knowing when to stop. That's not the same as being an idiot and going through and climbing Everest when you know you're going to die and go through the death zone. I mean, if the conditions are that bad, you turn back. What I'm saying is that sort of determination, that resolution that nothing is going to defeat you and, and it doesn't matter what it is, we can all get through it together. Now, I stopped everybody because I ended up leading this group in. I stopped everybody and said, stop, we're going to start singing some songs mm. as we pass over the line. 
And they all looked at me and said, we, you know, we can't even score. We're not going to sing a song. Mm. I said, we're going to sing a song. Fuck the training team. We're going to sing a song. Mm. And so we, we, we got ourselves together, smiled ourselves up, and went into camp singing a French Foreign Legion marching song. Right. So, you know, that you can engender this real spirit, even in immense pressure. And that's what gets you through. Blimey, Andy, that sounds incredibly brutal for someone who's like sitting in the comfort of her house and has never had any experiences like that. It was just training. Well, I know. But you see, what I find really interesting in, about this is, well, there's two things I find interesting. Firstly, the sense of pushing your own personal bound, pushing. So whoever it is that's training you is, is in a way having faith in you, in a way, if I can put it that way, it feels like they have faith that we have more in us than we sometimes believe that we have. So that's, that's the one thing that I think is incredibly, it stands out for me in when I listen to the sorts of training, talk about that disruption to one's sense of self. It can either, I suppose, take you out or it can actually help you believe. And, you know, this is like, when we talk about pressure, this is right up that end for me. I mean, obviously for all of us, but when you have someone that is holding you to believe that actually, and in this particular example, it's extreme physical resilience is one thing. Um, and then the other thing that you've mentioned three times, I think so far is a sense of humor. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I know about you, Andy, is that sense yeah. of, you know, how your mood can like <laughs> take you through some of the toughest things, which, which seems sometimes crass, but I think what you're telling me is that when you can send that message through your body, your physicality, your your physical, yeah. it's it's not a head thing. You're actually saying to your body, I'm smiling, I'm singing, I'm laughing. It's okay. We yeah. can continue. Yeah. Um, well, it's it's uh absolutely vital. And it's and it's, you know, having been fortunate and privileged enough to be a Royal Marines officer. Um, and serve with amazing people in all sorts of historical moments and wars, interventions until I left, frankly. Um, that sense of humour is so important. It was taught to us. It was drummed into us. Was it? Um, was as, it? You know, cheerfulness in the, in the face of adversity is one of the four tenets of the commando spirit. So cheerfulness in the face of face adversity. Uh, and the other three were... Uh, determination, courage, and uh, unselfishness. So those are four things that were drummed into us, and those four things made up what we called the commando spirit. And in training, uh, at the end of the commando course, uh, there was a sort of vote amongst ourselves. It wasn't the training team who were voting or anything like that. They weren't selecting prizes. But there was a, a medal. It was called the commando medal. And it was us voting for the person in our group who we thought displayed the commando qualities and the virtue and the commando spirit the most in training. Yeah. And you decided that as a team rather than anyone yeah. who was in a hierarchical yeah, we position. we selected our own people for that, you know. Wow. Um, because you, you know, you go through so much together, there's nothing that you don't know about anybody else. There's no hiding place. Um, and we're all, every single person goes through a moment when they're absolutely rock bottom. And this is where a brilliant team comes in. Because in life, lots of people have off days. Um, you know, lots of people, lots of people can't perform all the time. It's, unre and it's unrealistic to expect people yeah. to perform 100% all of the time at 100%. That's just totally unrealistic. Nobody ever can do that. So we all have to accept the limitations that we have. Um, and we all have different strengths and needs. Um, but, you know, you've got to pick each other up. And, and I suppose the if I was talking to somebody in Cirque du Delay who used to be a, a creative designer. And he used to say, well, one of the things that we used to insert to Soleil to uh, basically underscore the importance of teamwork was to get people to juggle. And then the person would bump them off the juggle and would have to try and catch the balls and keep juggling. 
and everybody would bump each other off. Because the whole point is, if you've got a team that accepts that some things drop, but somebody else is going to pick it up, that is a team that really trusts and collaborates and knows each other. Yeah. So I think, you know, there's, there's so many parallels. There are. And I think some of these things are expected in organisations without necessarily the, the training or, or the drill, you know, that you've just ex- described, which is obviously pretty hardcore. But how, how are you taught to be cheerful in adversity? Well, I think the instructors themselves, you know, there's always a sense of humour amongst instructors. And the drill instructors, of course, we see it, it ain't half, half hot mum, you know, and, and dad's army. But actually, there's an element of absolute truth around the joviality and the stories and the amusing things that happen, you know, done with a smile, done with a glint, done with a, well, you know, everybody mucks up and everybody's got to go through this. There's no way you can you can get through Royal Marines training or any special forces training or any elite training, you know, uh, without mucking up a lot. <laughs> Okay, yeah. and without getting a debrief, I mean, I mean, you know, the debriefs are <laughs> pretty hard-nosed, fair and realistic. Absolutely, there's no holds barred in a debrief. It's not about you know trying to humiliate somebody. It's actually trying to get to the truth of the issue very fast, so that you can improve somebody and help them get through whatever challenge they've got next. Yeah, And you've got to do things thoroughly, rigorously, and properly if you're going to train for conflict or any high-performing activity. Mm-hmm. And those people who think, you know, you, you deserve everything on a plate and you're just going to go through the process, it doesn't work like that if you're yeah. going to go into the ultimate crucible, the ultimate test yeah. when, you know, you're high-performing when it's a matter of life and death. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's there's no room for, you know, snowflake, you know, soft. Oh, I'm so precious about that. You know, you're all in it and you're all part of the debrief. And a brilliant team can take that honesty between each other as long as it's not humiliating and it's not, it's not rude and it has to be positive and mm-hmm. constructive. That's the key thing. Yeah. And, you know, I, th- I mean, you, you actually are touching on something that is important here, I think, with when when there is pressure, it's there needs to be a drill almost about how you feed forward in pressure, because otherwise, you know, the whole impulse and instinct in that feedback stroke feed forward can not necessarily enhance the performer. I think that that you know handling pressure um, is in a relationship between you and how you are as a person and what you've been through, the training, the skills that you have, the situations that you've been put in, uh, same goes to the team and how that works and the leadership and the team and whether that works or not and the honesty and the trust that exists and the ability to talk about reality and ground truth of Mm -hmm. everything. Mm. Because unless you can talk about that, you can't really start to deal with pressure. Um, And then the circumstance, the environment that you're in. And quite often, unless you're unfortunately caught in 9-11 in the in the in the tower, or you know, you're you're sitting at the foot of Vesuvius when it sort of explodes, Mm. then most of the situations we actually have time to work out how to deal with them. So you know, the pressure builds up, but actually how you deal with it can either exacerbate, magnify that pressure or or decrease the pressure. Um, so a lot of pressure is self-induced. A lot of pressure is based on expectation, pushing yourself too far, unrealistic ambitions, or not or, or putting yourself in a position where which you didn't need to put yourself in, taking undue risk when you don't need to. Uh, and so it's about how to to be clear and calm and collected by choosing your mood and the emotions that you have in whatever circumstance, whatever scenario. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and that demands a lot of acceptance of whatever situation you're in. Um, and if you can do all of those things, and I think I think um, we 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 were discussing, weren't we, the title of this? And I was thinking, what what do we call this? And I was thinking conflict, 
pressure and thresholds. Because when you think about better under pressure or not better under pressure, it is, it depends. <laughs> no, yes, it, depends. it does depend. What we want to do is turn it into something which is useful for us. Yeah. To uh, drive us into better decision making or better performance. Yeah. But if you don't know how to do that, then you could cross the threshold and you then start to get the uh, the worst circumstances of that sort of pressure equation. Yeah. And so it's really important to, you know, understand all of these things when you're um, in a high performing activity, whether it's sport, the performing arts, music, business, or the military. And actually to talk about those things and how we deal with it um, in our teams and put ourselves into scenarios when we're going to be under pressure. Mm. But there's a kind of fun in that because you're saying, well, actually, we're now, we're now going to get into a circumstance where we're going to put each other under a hell of a lot of pressure. And then there's no pressure mm. <laughs> because you know your expectation is there's all these things going to fly at you. And it's almost like, well, how can we perform brilliantly, you know, with all of these things? It becomes a great challenge, and it's an exploration. So sometimes I talk to people about going out of their comfort zone. I say, you know, we're going to go out of our comfort zone, and as long as you can accept that we're all going to be all right, mm. and whatever happens, we're going to get through it together, then just accept that and enjoy it as much as you can, even when for a day and a half we might not have any food, which has happened to me before. Yeah. 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 And as you're talking, I'm just thinking about how this transfers into, you know, a typical organization who are going so fast most of the time that are in this sort of back to back um, existence where what you've just been talking about is stopping, pausing, considering and preparing. It's almost impossible for a lot of the people that we're working with to make to, to actually boss that time so that they can do that, actually. And that is exactly the key to it. Um, I remember you and I, we did some videos, didn't we, at the beginning of, just before COVID. Just before COVID it was. We got together and designed checklists uh, and put our brains together. And one of the things that I learned, especially in campaigning, um, at the sort of strategic operational levels, I would say, but when I was a theatre commander in Basra, as commanding general of the coalition for Southeast Iraq, we had a long campaign. Um, and it was up to a year for some people, but it was basically 10 months to a year to finish off the campaign. And it was demanding of so many people in so many ways. Um, and there was, you know, rocket attacks and all sorts of things going on for some of that period. But you realize when you're going through phases and you're transitioning from one phase to another, you have to recognize there's a transition. And also you have to look and gauge what's happening to your people, mm. whether the pressure's too much and people are rushing and making mistakes and getting bad tempered and tired. Um, and actually, you know, things aren't getting done properly. Things are getting missed. Those are the telltale signs is the organization's creaking. So it actually becomes, uh, you know, the law of diminishing returns that comes self-defeating in, in, in extremists. Mm -hmm. So what I learned was we used to take strategic pauses and we used to call them, right, we're going into pause now. And that pause allowed a whole host of activities to take place, a reflection, learning, stand back, let people settle down, make sure the communication's going to the right places that people are settled it's almost like gathering a horse, resting a horse and gathering him for the final jump. You know, you're collecting the organization. Yeah. And and you have to you have to do that. So one of the things that we did a lot of during COVID uh was I used to run strategic pauses for a lot of clients. Mm. And we did exactly that and we worked out, you know, how to stand back, take stock and then take it to the next level. Mm. And lots of people say used to say to me well, how do you do that? Because we're running so fast, we've got a 24-7 operation and we can't stop. And I said, well, you do stop because you go to sleep. You do stop because you've got to eat. So you can stop to stand back and take a pause. Mm. And if you need to put somebody extra in to run that, then you stand back and do it. And I learned that from my parents.
to when they were running pubs. Mm. You know, because, you know, if, if my mum and dad were going to have a break, they had to get somebody else in. Yeah. You know, you can't just keep going. So, you know, you have to stand back and take a break. And people who say they can't do that, well, it's because they don't want to do it or they're scared of it or they're, they're, they're worried about dropping something. And so you as the leader have got to enforce that. Yeah. Uh, but it also it, it also relies on delegation, doesn't it? Like, you know, you just mentioned your parents. There's somebody else stepped in whilst they were taking a pause. So it's, you know, I'm, I'm presuming the war doesn't stop <laughs> during a campaign or, you know, it, 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 still things have to be done. So it's what I'm hearing from this is you have to be very strategic about who takes the pause, when they take the pause, but also what's going. It's almost like, you know, the, the business still carries on, doesn't stop the business. Yeah. Well, we used to say that you've got to train down to your third and fourth 11. Okay. So, for example, when I was a CEO of a commander unit, I used to work a system basically called now, next, and far. Okay. And the now is basically like zero to 20 past the clock. And this is what we've got to do to win the next part of the campaign, the next phase or battle or whatever it was. Uh, to the, the, the next was sort of like 20 past to 22 the hour, which is how we're going to kind of win. If you're Sir Alex Ferguson, he would say, how are we going to win the season? Uh, and the third part was the far was how are we going to build a brilliant club or how are we going to win the campaign overall? And as the leader, uh, when there's so many moving parts, and when I was a CEO commando unit, we were operating in 13 different countries. We had three back-to-back -to -back tours of over three months each. And two of those ended up in operations and in interventions, which we had no idea we were going to do, um, but had sort of prepared and were ready for whatever intervention there was in Sierra Leone twice um, during the troubles in 2000. So, you know, we did a heck of a lot. And you as a leader, um, you know, with this dispersed group of people all over the place, um, cannot do this by yourself. You have to work out now, next and far where you need to be to make the next best decision. You also need to give and delegate responsibilities to people down the chain. So the second person is going to stand in for you and the third person is going to stand in for you. In any case, I kind of learned that when people dying in conflict, yeah. because you know when the troop commander dies, a troop sergeant dies or a corporal dies, a Marine can end up running the troop. And actually, at Goose Green, the Battle of Goose Green, it, you know, the, those things were actually happening. It's the same in business. That um, if you're running a very sort of hard, high energy, fast business, you know, to get the quality in that business, you have to delegate and train people to do what you do. And by training people and delegating to train people what you do, you give yourself a break and you actually empower energize and you actually can achieve a hell of a lot more by doing that and so yes you have to learn to stand back and i never forget in the falcons war after just landing my company commander is an old aiden hand you know he's a great guy um, the first thing he told us to do as troop commanders once we got ashore and we established ourselves right get rest get right. some rest now enforced yeah. rest so commanders had enforced rest Hmm. Because commanders have got to think, they've got to prepare, and they've got to plan orders, and they've got to have en energy to be able to do all of that, to run everything, and their job isn't necessary to do what everybody else does. Monty used to get his eight hours sleep, regardless of the campaigns he was in, in the thick of the battle, he'd still get his eight hours sleep. Because he knew that that was absolutely vital to his performance when he was awake yeah shed is vital as you know sleep hydration yeah. exercise diet yeah you know dealing with pressure is about being in great physical condition and getting fantastic routines as you know your whatever yeah. routines they are i do but also that. your yes. men and then you know is that physical condition but also your emotional state and sort of learning how to uh, deal with pressure yourself and practice the right emotional state so you can choose deliberately how you turn up for things and how you handle pressure. And I think if you can 
get people to do those. That's that's the absolute basic foundation for everything. So, so agree. A lot of pressure is self-induced. Pressure based on our own excessive expectation, pushing ourselves too far, unrealistic ambition, and taking undue risk when we really don't need to. I'm reflecting on the commando spirit that Andy mentioned earlier on in the conversation. Courage, determination, unselfishness, and cheerfulness in the face of adversity. When I think of these, it makes complete sense that in order to honor that spirit in the extreme pressure of a war scenario, enforced rest becomes an essential performance enhancer. It makes me smile because I remember meeting Andy for a meeting a few years ago in the afternoon. And as I walked into the busy and noisy restaurant, there was Andy, upright in an armchair, taking a nap. When I arrived in front of him, he opened his eyes and said, smiling, once a Marine, always a Marine, naps. We were drilled to take naps whenever we could. I was aware of it too, thanks to my business partner, Simon, also an ex-Royal Marine, who would take what he called a powering down moment. Andy makes an important link here though, I think, between enforced rest and delegation. For most of the people we work with, this idea of enforced rest gets compromised because of lack of delegation. If we don't delegate well, we can't rest. We put pressure on ourselves by believing that only we can do it. Andy used the phrase train down, ensuring that there are others who can fill his role. No one is indispensable, and that's a fact. What is ringing out so strongly in this is the importance of standing back and taking a break. Because if we don't, we're diluting the commando spirit for everyone, putting the team and the campaign at risk. To be cheerful without rest is hard enough, and that's before you throw in adversity. Modeling any of those commando spirit pillars is going to be tougher when we don't take rest. Now, I know that most of us, thankfully, are not in a war situation, but what Andy is emphasizing so strongly here for me is that to be courageous, determined, to put others first and have the capacity to be cheerful in adversity, whatever situation you find yourself in, it still starts in your shed. And if you can't sleep, rest is also good. The basics count, even more so it seems in a war situation. When we honor our shed, we're better able to choose our mood and as a consequence, better able to focus our mind and make clear decisions. A piece of research that relates to most of us and backs up the importance of rest was carried out by Microsoft's Human Factors Lab. They studied 14 participants in two groups across two days of video meetings. Group one underwent four 30-minute meetings back to back. Group two underwent four 30-minute meetings with a 10-minute break in between them. During the experiment, both groups wore EEG caps to monitor their brain activity. The results for group one showed that going from one meeting straight to another created a cumulative buildup of stress in the brain. Anticipation of the quick transition caused more spikes. In group two, the 10 minute breaks between meetings was enough to allow the brain to reset, therefore reducing the stress buildup. Conclusion, a short break promotes performance. It may not be a matter of life and death, but it really is a worthwhile investment. I've always wondered, and you know I believe heavily in shed, and, but I've always wondered when you're in battle, how do you honour your shed conditions enough to be able to, to enable you to go on and continue? And like with the campaign, campaign you've just described, what is enough when you're in a situation like that? And how well, do you judge that? We, we can, we have got far more in us than we imagine. Yes, I believe We've got that. so much potential in us. And most people in life will never realise that, never fulfil the potential which is within them. Okay. So come at the moment, come in the person. You know, some people will thrive in that harsh reality, that uncertain, chaotic environment where people are trying to kill you mm -hmm. and it's lasting a long, long time. So we're going to have to sustain it. But, you know, in the military, as you would expect, there are drills and routines for everything. When we go into defence, we have what's called routines in defence. You know, and these are routines designed, A, to make sure that you're professionally, you know, preparing the position for all contingencies. But you yes. get into routines, even if you're in the thick of it, so that you can sustain your energy through the worst possible moments. And you have to conserve your energy. And one of the principles of war is called economy of effort. Mm. You know, 
people are running at 100 percent all of the time won't sustain it now some of the time fine and we all know that an extremist you have to search occasionally make that incredible effort yeah you're then going to come down from that effort so you've got to rest and it's a bit like you know i'm thinking of this world cup time so i'm thinking back to england versus new zealand semi-final of 2019 world cup you know they never recovered from that peak you know something went wrong in the week before the final yeah and I don't know what it was. It could have been the emotional state or too knackered or whatever it was. But, yeah. um, you know, South Africa did a better job preparing for that for that emotional yes. you know, peak. So, um, so it's interesting when you're looking at the travail, travails of the England rugby team now. Um, but the point, the, point, the point is, is that you have to husband your energy. You have to conserve your resources. Um, you you know you you have to peak for some things, and you need to know how to do that. You need to know how to get to the height of a state. So, for example, in the Falklands War, um, we had to crash move a fifty minutes notice to move right at the end of six weeks being in the field to go and attack a position called Sapper Hill. We had fifty minutes to get ready for the attack. Um, and we had to, we were absolutely exhausted after six weeks of being in the field and marching all over the place and everything that went on in the war. You know, I, I actually had to get every person in my troop together, give a quick set of instructions, working on standard operational procedures. That's all we had time to do. And then I actually went around every single person in the troop and punched them in the gut as hard as I could. And I said, wake up. We are going in for this. You have to be here, and we're going to go into battle. We're going to land, and then we're going to fight and take a position. So we we absolutely raised ourselves. I remember getting in a helicopter to go into the assault, and we were screaming. We It's the only way I thought, the only way I knew how to get us to that position mm. to go in and be prepared to kill people. Yeah. That's the only thing. Now, as it happened, the first helicopter in the in the helicopters that went actually landed at navigation area. It landed on the D, on, on the on the side of the enemy position. So the first people in the helicopters landed into what's called a hot DZ. They landed with fire coming into them, and uh, you know the, the 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 troop commander bravely uh, managed to get everybody in the cover, and then you know the drills kicked in, and he gave a very clear fire control order, which was taught in training. You know, group range indication type of fire, grit. You know, you learn these things for a bloody good reason because under pressure, you'll remember those things. Yes, absolutely. You won't remember anything complicated. Yeah. You'll remember those simple things that have been drilled instinctively yeah. so they come innate yeah. in you. Yeah. That's the only way you can survive under intense pressure when people are trying to kill you. Now, a lot of people got shot, were wounded on the side. We, Our helicopter landed safely, thank goodness, and we marched through to a place that we could have attacked ourselves. But the point is, is that, you know, in the space of several months, you don't know when you're going to have to raise yourself to that crescendo to make the ultimate, in the ultimate test, the ultimate test of courage, really. Because um, it just happens like that. Um, and you, you have no choice. Mm. You have no choice. Mm. You have to raise yourself to that level because if you don't, you're not going to make it. Mm. But to raise yourself at that level, you have to know everybody so well. They have to trust each other and they're prepared to do anything for each other. Mm. Okay. And so you have to build that good team. And mm. you do that by going through difficult moments together, being out of your comfort zone, shared hardship and endeavor together being close to each other, being honest with each other, looking after each other and doing what it takes when lots of people want to give up and keep going. Yeah, crikey. I mean, as you're speaking, I'm constantly thinking, and what's the lesson and how do we transfer that? Because what you're saying there is that you have an intense sense of journey together. What I'm experiencing, what we're experiencing a lot in organizations is that teams don't stay teams for very long. There are people in and out incredibly quickly. 
And so I think the task of a leader at the moment is trying to bond a team extremely quickly in this way so that actually the ups and downs of business, which, okay, yes, you're giving us a real perspective here, a real sense of perspective, Andy. You know, like most of us are not needing to be punched in the stomach, thank God, in order to be able to face the next moment. That's an extreme situation. But if we were to take some of the lessons from that, what I'm taking from it is how does a leader with an um, ever-changing team, which I think is going to be the way now, m- more so than ever, h- how does a leader quickly and fast bond a team so that they have all of those ingredients you just described so that they can face the organisational pressure that is ahead of them? Yeah, I think it's a superb question, Sarah, because... You know, COVID, remote working, um, people's choices, whether they want to work at home or work in the office, the social isolation that people get, which means they can't bond in the same way um, to raise performance, whatever the endeavor is. There's all sorts of different scenarios, but I think uh, with matrix management as well, mm. um when people really got sort of efficient and effective at what they were doing, and there was this sort of sense of journey and purpose and truth around things, it was like a beacon. It was like, you know, bees around a honeypot. I mean, honestly, people just get attracted to that because they want to belong. Mm. comes back to belonging. They want to belong to this amazing endeavor because the leader and the core team of that endeavor have made it something really special. Mm. And so, you know, there's that sense of, Osmos- osmotic effect yeah. Yeah, yeah. that increases the performance of everybody. And so it's a question of saying, okay, what is my context? What's my structure? What's my scenario? How do we do stuff around here? What do we need to do to create that sense of purpose, endeavor, and also to go on a journey together? Mm-hmm. To go on a journey together, sometimes you need to go out of the environment to you know, go out of your comfort zone with people in a productive and sort of diverse way so it's fair and equitable for everybody. But, you know, you've you got to do it so that you know each other. It might actually just be we're all going to go and walk somewhere and cook together for, you know, 24 hours and just live together in a in a, in a a hut and, you know, mm. walk, walk, walk and do some stuff. Um, but, you know, you've got to do that to get this sense of perspective and... Um, I think that's what I think that's what you know we've been kind of doing ourselves um, sometimes together and sometimes separately in, ev- in all the interventions we've had over the last ten years mm. is how to sort of get this sense of togetherness and belonging mm. and to work out how um, because you know a team is better than well a good team is is awesome good team can do anything mm. uh, a bad team is worse than no team in my experience yeah. Yeah, yeah. So in the military, I used to get rid of bad teams, um, you know, and spread them out and change things because actually a bad team is worse than no team. Yes. It's wasting your time with it. So yeah. actually, you know, creating teams and, sh- and, and and having the guts and the courage to ship people around yeah. um, to, to, to forge that identity and get a sense of belonging based on collective purpose is really important. Yeah. Um, I want to touch on, I mean, you've given me a very extreme example about how you manage other people's pressure, <laughs> like, you know, the punch in the stomach, which I, by the way, will never forget. Actually, funnily enough, the troop that when we have our reunions, they never forgot it either. <laughs> no, I bet they did not. I bet they did not. But I mean, how do you, on a more serious <laughs> note, in a way, how how do you manage? Because we said earlier on, you know, that pressure's received in different ways for different people. and often with leaders that I work with, you know, they get frustrated because something is ex- is experienced as pressure for somebody else that they don't think is pressurized in the least. So how do you manage, what would be your, what have you learned from managing so many different teams in these extreme situations? Um, what would be your your advice around managing others' pressure when you're not necessarily feeling the pressure or you've think, managed to manage it, you, you're holding your pressure together? I think, um, first of all, I'd want to understand what's going on. 
and get to know people and and how that relates to the environment, the circumstances, the you know whatever's going on, the context. So that's really important to understand that. And I think that you as the leader of any endeavor, the responsibility is to reduce pressure as much as possible. You can only do that by getting to know people and talking to them and seeing what's going on. So that's the kind of almost your starting point. And then you can work out what needs to be done to get on top of the situation. Andy, have you uh, got an example of somebody in any of the teams that you've worked with in in war situation where the pressure went into a, a really strong, depleting, negative pressure that meant that they weren't in any situation, weren't able to perform? What did you, how did you use that to turn them around? Can you just talk, can you give us a very specific example? I don't know if anything comes to mind. Actually, I suppose Basra holistically is quite a good example. So um, me and my team um, took over the running of uh, Basra in Southeast Iraq between 0809. Um, you know, we were in a really bad place in the spring of 2008. We were nearly defeated. Um, the morale was at an all-time low the, for the whole of that campaign. The relationship with the Americans was at an all-time low. We were getting regularly criticised for our poor performance. We were getting slagged in the media anyway because nobody liked Iraq, and the politicians were keen to get out as fast as possible. So there, there was a battle. There was a battle for Basra. On Good Friday of 2008, it started. It was called Charge of the Knights. The Americans came in with the Iraqis, and basically took over. The commander, uh, the general was actually away on his break, um, you know, which was just unfortunate. And they, the Americans decided that they were to bring their headquarters down into Basra. So they, co they constructed a temporary headquarters and put a general in charge of it and basically shut us out. You know, this was in our patch, <laughs> right? So it couldn't, it couldn't have been, but it couldn't have been worse. Um, now I was sort of watching all of this from afar the sort of brigade commander that was sort of left in charge in an amazing job of picking up the pieces and trying to sort of do a bit of a regain. But the morale was so bad that at that sort of particular low point, I decided uh, when I was thinking about it before I sort of spoke to anybody else really, that, you know, there's only one way to go from that low moment and that's upwards. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We can't be defeated. Mm. So everything was about it's a new opportunity to do something radically different. So I call it, called it a Kairos moment. Now is the time mm. to come up with something different. Mm. And we basically turned the campaign on its head and sort of did something which was 180 degrees completely opposite from what had been doing, done before. The point was is that when we arrived in that place my core team of 50 descended on the whole of the sort of headquarters in basra it was kind of taking everybody infecting them with a new sense of purpose and a new intention a new campaign plan and and demonstrating that very 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 quickly by doing some huge big decisions which you know if they hadn't played our way um, you know, we would have been finished, really. But actually having the courage to make some big decisions and to, to take early action fast. Okay. And to instill a sense of purpose and confidence in that. And also by almost like everybody, I remember people telling us, crikey, we've got Marines coming into Baz, we're going to run this thing. Holy shit, that's going to be dreadful. We're going to so hard-nosed and all that sort of thing. And, you know, this is all civilians because a lot of civilians, a lot of different types of agencies in there. It was sort of a, quite a big group of people. Uh, you know, thousands of people. It was me as the general, and because you've got to realise if you're the general in charge of a campaign, how you are, whether you smile or not, the way you treat people sets the tone for everything. Mm. So from the very, very moment that you pitch up, you have to work out, contingent to the circumstances that you find yourself in, how are you going to settle everybody down, reduce the pressure, and 
get this sense of purpose and, you know, stop everybody flapping around all over the place and just collect everybody. That's your job when you arrive. That's what you've got to do. We did that and it made a phenomenal difference. You know, so that's a, that's the sort of biggest example I can think of when you've got to, when the, when the stakes were actually, when I look back at it, the stakes were pretty high. Now, the other thing as a senior leader there, when you, when you get told, like I knew I was going to be either commanding in South Afghanistan or I was going to be commanding in Southeast Iraq, I was chosen to be a general to go and be a commander. That was my first general's appointment. So, you know, I was thinking to myself, holy shit, uh, this is straight in the deep end. And then somebody said, you're going to Basra. And people were patting me on the shoulder, said, good luck, mate. You know, I wouldn't, wouldn't want your job. You know, poison chalice. And um, nobody teaches you how to be a general, right? You know, you don't go on a general's course. I mean, you do a higher command and staff course and all that sort of thing to learn how to campaign and stuff. But anyway, actually, actually nobody te teaches you generalship. And so I got a book um, called Generals to read how other generals had done it. And actually being a military historian and, you know, just loved sort of reading about how leaders, you know, do their business. You know, you soon realize that actually it's it's up to you. You're the general. You can either make a difference or you, you can either fail. Well, we had no choice really. And, and then I said, well, I'm going to make a difference. You know, we're going to do it right. So I just accepted totally accepted the responsibility on my shoulders and my position. And as soon as I totally accepted that, all the pressure kind of disappeared. Wow. Now, the second thing was that I had a very, very close team. And there was a debate, you know, back in the UK on how long were we going to go for, you know, how long was this going to take, you know, to close the campaign down? And nobody really knew the answer to that. Partly was conditions based and partly was going to be agreed with the Americans on, you know, how we were going to terminate and extract ourselves because it really depended on the American, American support at a very tricky time in Iraq where resources are tight. And so I got my sort of inner core team together, my chief of staff, my deputy chief of staff, some of my senior guys. We said, look, this is what's at stake. What do we think about how long we want to be doing this for? And every single person in the team and in the wider team of 50 in my core team back in the UK at the time said, you know what? We'll do it until it's finished. It doesn't matter how long it's going to take. And so we said, okay. So I said, look, are you telling me that even if it's a year or longer, that you're happy to just stick it and do it to the end and do it right? And they said, yes. And so we got back in touch with, you know, our permanent joint headquarters and the ministry and said, it doesn't matter how long it's going to be, we'll just do it and stick it out to the end. And that's exactly what we did. It took a long time. But we had that sort of sense of togetherness before we even got there because we had a, a purpose. We believed in what we were doing. And actually, we wanted to do it right so that UK military could hold its head up high and we could sort of leave there having done a brilliant job. Yeah. So the things I'm hearing from that is how you managed you in that situation was utter acceptance of the responsibility. Yes. And as you described that, Andy, it felt like something like it was a physical, there's something physical, even though you were saying it, it felt like there was a physical release in that acceptance, which I'm interested in. Um, you know, there's obviously something you do to fully accept something yeah. when, when, when you are under pressure. Yeah. Do you know what it is that you do to let acceptance in and the pressure more yes. into yeah. what is it that you do? So it's it's really centered on purpose, why we are doing something and the conviction and the faith that you have that the purpose is pure and whatever we do, we'll do whatever it takes to deliver that because it's such a beautiful purpose. And normally the wider, higher purpose is about saving people's lives or making a difference to people or the conditions of whatever you find yourself in. So the higher purpose is very important. So having sort of worked all, all of that out, and of course, you know, I, I was selected to do this mm -hmm. after a long, long time in my career. Mm -hmm. 
where I'd gone through nearly every campaign that the UK has been involved in. I commanded and led at every single level in war and conflict. And I'd worked with some outstanding leaders of all kinds from all the services, being part of the chiefs of staff set up. So I'd seen generals in war make hard decisions and being part of that decision-making process when I was a relatively young guy as a lieutenant colonel. So I had faith and I said, I can do this. I believe in it and we've got to do it. So I knew what to do. I absolutely knew what to do. For once in my life, I kind of worked out that I knew what to do. Um, so I had that sort of faith and that conviction that comes through hard-won experience and reflection. And I had selected my team as well. So I knew I had a strong team. Then we got a brilliant plan together. We co-created the plan amongst everybody. I had people sort of flying out to Iraq and the States and working with all sorts of people for months before we were doing this. So, you know, co the co-creation of what we were going to do empowered everybody else and got the buy-in and inclusivity you need from the team. And there's still a final step to take. And it's a bit like any situation, whether you're an alcoholic, drug addict, you're getting divorced, you're grieving, or you're Johnny Wilkinson, because Johnny Wilkinson will say this in his podcast, um, which I thought Johnny Wilkinson's amazing. This guy is amazing because he's got to recognize it. Resistance to something creates pain. Mm -hmm. Pain depletes your energy. Pain is something that the body bears as well. Yes. In extremists, that pain can turn to illness. The body keeps the pain. People get ill under heavy pressure and heavy stress. And those are some signs that you have to look for in yourself and in your team too when people start getting ill through pressure and stress. And we know the neurological reasons for that and the chemicals that flood around your body like cortisol, which you know eventually can really kill you. You can create cancer. To get rid of the pain, you have to get rid of the resistance. Mm -hmm. To get rid of the resistance, you have to accept, totally accept, the situation that you find yourselves in. And it also means being all in. So it's making a pact with each other, actually, yeah. which we did. And I've done several times with different teams over the yeah, years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're all in on this, right? We're all in. We're going to do whatever it takes to make this happen. Yeah. We're all accepting the situation. We're finding ourselves. There's only one way of going, and that's upwards yeah. and forwards and, you know, success. Me accepting my role was fundamental to the yes, way yes. I handled that. Yes. And actually was not worried whether some of the things I did went badly or wrong or not, because I knew that we were going to give it our best shot. And I knew because of the team I selected that we were going to sort of find good ways of doing things and best ways of doing things. And I trusted my team. I think that was probably the biggest thing for me looking back. Phew, Andy, that was really actually, I found that very moving listening to you to, to share that because I really felt it. and. What's singing out of this whole conversation for me is loyalty, how you breed loyalty, actually, and how none of this feels like it's in service to anything other than something bigger than all of you. And when you were describing it, how you do fully accept the situation, the context that you find yourself in, you went to, who are you serving? Who we are serving are the people in conflict situations. Hmm. We're serving the people. That's what we're there for. And that's why fundamentally things go well or they don't. Yeah. For military and interventions and wars and conflicts. It's very interesting in Basra because years later, I kept in touch with some Iraqis. And uh, I was actually in Amman in Jordan. And I, you know, at that stage, I was working with the London School of Economics. And we were working on a, a legacy project that, you know, we'd set up when I was in Basra. And we met some of the, the, the local government that sort of came over to Amman. Um, and it was with Prince Hassan and, and something called the Wana Forum. And this is just before the Arab Spring. Uh, so there's quite a lot of tension in the air as well. A couple of people from 
the Basel governorate came up to me and said, you know what? We haven't forgotten what you did in Basra and the love that you had for people and how you always tried to make the lives of our people better, not just me individually, but our, our whole efforts. And I'm, I'm, I'm sort of so proud of that legacy, actually, because that's what it's all about. Mm. That's absolutely what we're all about. And if we forget why we're doing things, which is about humanity and to make people's lives better and to alleviate suffering and pain and build better lives for people. That's what we're there for. And if we forget that, then that's when we get into trouble with the interventions that we have. And we have had, you know, a real sort of mixed record of that since 9-11, sadly. Yeah. Yeah, we've got some things badly wrong and we've made the lives for people worse. Yeah. Uh, and so we forget that. So based on the conversation I had with my team on why we were going to Basra, it was to help Iraqis lead a better life for themselves and to help them choose the life that they wanted for themselves. And our job was to enable and catalyze and support Iraqi people in doing that. And that was the whole premise of our campaign. And the fundamental difference was that we were looking through the lens of people and not the lens of enemies. Mm. And that was the first time in the whole of that campaign that we started to do that properly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that leads to a hugely different approach. Yeah. And yeah. so that's what you have to have yeah. to make a difference. Thank you, Andy. That's been incredibly uh, thought provoking, actually. I wanted to pause here for a minute because listening to Andy talk is a powerful example of what happens when we talk from a place of truth and meaning. When we can find this strength of purpose, something happens. Our body and words become one, connecting to a deep place of truth. It feels fluid. It's a strong reminder of what happens when we connect to something that really matters to us, beyond self-interest, and how that can then move others to follow. I actually found it quite emotional, and of course, the word emotion has motion right at the heart of it. I was genuinely moved when he was talking about the pressure of responsibility. I felt him, and that reminded me of the importance of feeling it ourselves when we're trying to move others to action. We have to feel it ourselves because that on the whole is what moves others. I often work with people who want to move others through a talk or a conversation or a presentation, but I struggle to feel them. I don't feel why it matters to them. We need to allow the feeling, accept it, and use it to move ourselves and therefore others forward. Full acceptance of both the pressure and the responsibility that goes with it is a huge message that Andy lands in this conversation, and purpose plays a crucial role in his ability to fully accept. It's a higher purpose beyond self-interest. For Andy, it's saving people's lives and making a difference to alleviate suffering, but I think when any of us are navigating pressure, it's a vital force to ask what's the purpose beyond ourselves that can support us in turning the pressure into a useful, vital energy that can help us learn and grow. In order for Andy to fully accept, he has to tap into his why and use that belief and conviction to power up both his and others' commitment to keep going, despite the pressure and the challenge of the circumstance. He's really got me thinking about what happens when we resist anything. I mean, I love the way Andy describes the energy debt and the pain that we create for ourselves when we resist. He reminds us that the body takes on the pain of resistance too, and if we're not careful, that can lead to illness. To get rid of the pain, we have to get rid of the resistance. To get rid of the resistance, we have to choose to accept. When we choose to fully accept the situation that we find ourselves in, we can then choose to put what energy we have into choosing what to do to go forward. I realise that in this instance, Andy is talking specifically about leading in the context of a war, but this principle of accepting has so much resonance for me in other areas of life. How much energy do we waste on resisting, leaving us little resource to remain in charge of ourselves and to actively make a considered choice, whatever the pressure? What I love now about what you're choosing to do with your life is you've gone back to in a way, back to the singing, back to the using other performing arts to tell the story. Well, Journey Through Conflict, um, which is, you know, you've seen some of our productions, yeah, um, is all about, you know, combining 
story, music, art and culture, co-creating performances and productions with people who've experienced and been affected by conflicts of one kind or another. It doesn't have to be war, it can be different conflicts. And of all the things that I've done in the last 10 years, in fact, almost in life, that has been so fulfilling because we've touched people, we've helped them get into a different place than they were um, through the suffering that they've experienced. That's the purpose that kind of motivates me these days and actually helping people in business do that as well so that they can create a much better existence and a legacy that exceeds the, the current horizon so that actually we're, we're, we're trying to take them to a place where they can really do some good yeah. for themselves and for others. Yeah. Because I think in, in life, we need that higher sense of purpose. Mm. You know, if we're concentrating on just self, consumerism, materialism, you know, we're just going to get nowhere. It just yeah. actually makes everything worse. So we have to yeah. learn how to give of ourselves as a community. And you don't tap into that until you get a sense of purpose. Yeah. It reminds me of um, Juro, who I had on this uh, podcast a few months back, and he just said, you need to know why you're under pressure for what purpose. And I think, you know, your whole articulation today has been about going back up to the purpose, um, back up to who you're serving, back up. I mean, I think you started the conversation about let go of the ego. Um, and it's interesting, you know, for someone who's not really connected to the world of military in any way whatsoever, it's so easy to have a particular view of it from the outside. And what you've done for me today, Andy, is really take me un into the underbelly of, you know, the humanness of what it's like to lead in that sort of situation and the lessons that we can take from that in environments that maybe are not life and death, but nevertheless sometimes feel like it. <laughs> they can turn into life and death. Yes, yes. I mean, suicide rates, unhappiness, yes, violence, uh, you know, the polarisation in society that we feel, uh, the gap, the widening gap between the haves and the have-nots. Yeah. You know, it all comes back to what do we do? How do we conduct our lives? For what reason are we here? We have to help people who are not able to help themselves. The prosperous and the better off people have to give of themselves to help other people lead a better life and to create a better society. That's what we have to do. I can't think of any greater purpose for anybody. And it might not be war and life and death, but these things can be life and death to people. They yes. literally can be life and death. You're absolutely and we saw that during COVID. Yes. Yes. It feels sort of slightly... <laughs> <laughs> um, Sorry about I that, do Sarah. To ask you now around the two questions that I typically ask a guest, which is, you know, what out of everything that you've said, what two things, Andy, would you say to anyone who wants to is on the journey of becoming better under pressure, so they can turn it into this sort of energy you've just been describing, you know, being galvanized by it to do something possibly bigger than they ever thought was possible. What two things would you leave them with? Work out who you are and why you're here and apply all of that, the gifts that you have within you, to a higher purpose. And I think it was a great philosopher who said the moment of fulfillment for us is applying the joy of the gifts that we have mm. to the world's deepest hunger. And so I think that basically sums it up for me. It's, it's basically you and the purpose, your purpose and the higher purpose. And if you can find that combination, I think you're going to live an incredibly fulfilled life full of joy and happiness, whatever situation you find yourself in. And it means giving of yourself, letting your soul reign free and putting your ego into the right place for, for all of that to happen and accepting who you are and accepting whatever you find yourself in. When you say know who you are, do you have a practice for that that you, that you regularly do? Because I think that's an incredibly difficult question. There's sort of quite a lot of meditation 
spiritual practices that you know you can use to help and training yourself in the right way uh to allow what is within you to appear you know you're unconscious to become conscious but actually to give yourself the chance to be connected to the wider universe yeah. to be connected to the ground that we stand on nature around us the universe the people spend some time exploring that um and to appreciate all of what we have around us which, which is so beautiful allow yourself the space you've got to give yourself the space i think to just let that come forth uh, i do a practice which is called free writing mm -hmm. basically i get into a meditative state and normally it's through listening to piano music um because i find i found that when i was working with tom through his meditation music um i was going into completely different places you know it's just quite incredible you get into a sort of blissful state really uh, of deep meditation then what i do is i close my eyes and i grab a pen and in my journal i don't force anything but i just let whatever comes out of the pen come out it is quite surprising what comes out when you look at it. Yeah. It's actually very cosmic. I know this sounds bizarre, far out, man, but it is really cosmological. I have built on my exploration through trial and error. And as I'm talking with you now, you know, I'm, I'm beginning to feel that energy from my hands because yeah. that's actually what happens. Yeah. And the energy in the universe um, you become part of. And by becoming part of that energy, you uncover what you really have to offer. Yeah. If that makes sense. Well, it makes total sense to me because I'm on a similar journey. So I I appreciate us finishing this conversation in that way, Andy. Thank you so much. That was brilliant. And you know, if it hadn't been such a good subject, knowing and knowing you as I do, um, you know, we've got to we've got to answer the question, right? So so I hope that we sort of kind of did answer that question today. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Better Under Pressure with me, Sarah Milne If you enjoyed it, please do subscribe and let us know what you found useful or what you'd like to know more about. Our aim is to share as many examples as possible of what people do to manage pressure for better and turn it into a positive relationship. If you're interested in any of the practices mentioned, check out my book, The Shed Method, or alternatively, you can find us at Coaching Impact or me on LinkedIn and Instagram. Better Under Pressure was produced by the fab team at Smart Cookie Media. Thanks so much for listening. And until next time, goodbye.